foil this guy. That's it. I could be a foiler, so don't let me foil my feet around. Talking with your hands and <laughs> yeah. kicking stuff, and so that's just, okay. That's a great thing about most of life is that if something's broken, it can be... Yeah, I didn't really look in the mirror that much. <laughs> like, what is going on here? I gotta call the guy that cuts my hair. Hey, buddy. You gotta work on something. Um, well, let's, let's do this thing. So it is recording. Let's okay. Let's double check. Yep. <laughs> Get excited. Bam. <laughs> yeah. Destroy. Do you have a time limit or anything? Nope. No. I'm open. Yeah. All right. Seven hour podcast. <laughs> Here we come. I can talk a lot, so. Nice. Yeah. I am also about to do my best to not spill coffee all over. <laughs> Table is in route to be delivered today. Um, sweet. So yeah, so this thing, you got it. You're in a good spot. Do you want yeah, me to grab your so. coffee for you? Mm. Look at you. Oh, flexible. Making it happen. Sweet. Oop. Hello? Hello. Cool. I think we got it. All right. We have arrived. So we just did like a pre-podcast podcast with all the <laughs> talking and getting to know each other before this. Um, very cool. Uh, tell me about your art real quick, by the way. So sure. you're showing me a zombie painting. Mm-hmm. It made me think of this really kind of like up and coming thing. It's massive right now. The NFTs, non fungible tokens. Never even heard of it. Oh, get out of here. Okay. So, uh, first you tell me about your art and then I'll talk okay. about that. Well, what I showed you is technically an illustration or a digital painting. Um, I do everything by hand to start because I like the feeling of drawing with my hand, although they're not what they used to be. I used to be a lot steadier. I think it's all the coffee. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) But I start with hand drawings and then I'll scan it in and then trace on top of that with any kind of drawing tablet. A lot of people use the iPad Pro and Procreate, which is an amazing tool if you're an artist. My sister highly recommends it. She's an incredible artist. Um, And then after I trace it on the tablet and bring it into the digital landscape, uh, if you will, I will then add color and you can do all kinds of fun stuff in there. But it makes it, um, as a minimalist, a lot easier to get the effects that I want without having to break out a ton of materials. Mm -hmm. So I do love that aspect. Uh, I love you said as a minimalist too. So you're actually using buzzwords that are used to describe uh, like NFTs, non-fungible tokens. So I'm not going to be able to give the best breakdown of non-fungible token (laughs) versus a fungible token. You know, it has to do with like real estate. Essentially what it is, things that we value in the real world, like Mm -hmm. you commented on some art I have here. Sure. So it's a physical piece of art. Mm -hmm. I am the original owner. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, it has a value. If someone were interested in it, they would have to purchase it from me. Right. You could copy it. You could reprint it. You could take a picture of it, all these things, but that's the original. Mm-hmm. So that is happening in the digital world in a really, really big way. I mean, originally, I think you could look at, maybe not originally, but you could just look at video games mm-hmm. um, like Fortnite. My nephews, they love Fortnite. Mm-hmm. So they buy skins, they buy outfits, they buy all these things, and they own that skin or outfit, it gives them uh, clout or they're, they're, they check out my cool outfit. Sure. So in the digital world, these NFTs, these non-fungible tokens are ownership mm. of original art. So there, there was a guy yesterday that just sold one for $65 million. Dang. And uh, it's crazy. Everything's happening in cryptocurrency and yep. blockchain. And that's the technology really that made it possible is blockchain because mm-hmm. of being able to identify and, and the trust factor of this is the original. Right. Um, That's so really cool because yeah. as, you know, having art published online, that is one of the biggest issues that we run into um, as a company. Uh, you know, I mean, you put something out there and if you don't want to have a watermark on it, it's going to get stolen. And, I, you know, I actually have to hire somebody just to remove, you know, the copied images on a daily basis because it's a nonstop, you know, flow of people saying, oh, well, this is popular. I'm going to copy it and mm. it's easy to do. So 
I yeah. just think about on my cell phone, like I'll screenshot something. I'm like, cool, that's my background. And yeah. so, you know, you think of a million people having this background and the person that owns it, there's that value. So there's some yeah. things I'll share with you. It's called, there's one called super rare is a website. And, okay. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. So I, I actually, uh, have little to no knowledge about your business. Okay. Tell me, tell me more. Sure. So my sister and I were raised in New York you can imagine what the political environment was there. Extremely liberal, and our parents were straight up hippies, like in the traditional sense of the word. Um, you know, I mean, we've had our fair share of sweat lodges and chanting and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, the hippie will never die inside of me. <laughs> <laughs> I still use plant medicine, and there's a lot of stuff that I took from that upbringing that I find very valuable. Um, but we, as we got older, just started asking questions really and we were to quote myself in our story we were faced with a barrage of emotional extremism that just you know if you ask a question and somebody has an extremely emotional response and doesn't want to have an intelligent dialogue and doesn't really have any um you know facts or logic to back up what the fanaticism is about we were like, okay, there's something going on here. So I actually started doing a bunch of research um, first. I was the first one in my family. <laughs> and my sister, each, you know, each of us on our own accord, just started kind of researching things and realizing, you know, because we were pretty extreme left, you know, like thinking like everything we're doing is for the right <laughs> of the people and the mm -hmm. planet. And, you know, just it after all the research, it really kind of, it changed and we realized that maybe everything we thought to be true wasn't true, you know, mm. and um, we've always been artists. Uh, our mother is an artist. She's an amazing artist. And my sister is incredible. I mean, she's like next level. I'm OK, but she really takes things to the next level. And we we wanted to create a business that stands for free speech and basically, you know, all of the the clauses in the constitution that's pretty much to sum it up what we stand for as a company so it's called red pill 45 red pilling is the process of <laughs> you know becoming less liberal if you will <laughs> mm. and kind of uh being on the other side uh <laughs> although you know we're not traditional conservatives by any mean you know we're very much middle of the road we vary on different issues but when it comes to the basis of free speech, right to bear arms, all of these things that we believe to be God-given rights, you know, those were things that didn't even concern us when we were younger. And um, just after doing a lot of research and seeing that maybe that wasn't the focus of, of what we had believed previously, um, we were just like, okay, we need, to, we need to do something to contribute to this movement, to be aware of these things and to protect these rights because we realized after time that that was not that was not a goal of ours previously whether it was subliminal or not it doesn't matter you know we we started to realize okay like we need to actually do something to contribute to these rights so we um decided on red pill 45 again because of the red pilling 45 because of the 45th president <laughs> mm. and there therein red pill 45 was born we used our uh, my business skills and my sister's art skills and just joined forces to create you know merchandise and clothing and apparel and things that represent what we stand for so a lot of free speech stuff a lot of you know uh edgy, <laughs> somewhat, um, I wouldn't say uh, too offensive to some, but very offensive to some, yes. Mm. Yeah, there are, you know, there are things that really um, get people's goat, let's say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, being offended is a choice, too. Mm -hmm. That's really it is interesting. Yeah. You know, how does one, I was talking to a friend, We've been friends for, how old am I? 20 years. We've probably been friends for like 20 years yeah. or so, 20, 19, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And we we hadn't spoke much in the last couple of years. And we got on the phone. It was really neat. He was driving. We got in conversation. 
probably an hour of talking. Mm -hmm. It was mostly about politics. Mm -hmm. And he's super far left, San Francisco tech guy. Um, And there was a point where he said, it's very clear to me, you know, that one side is far more evil than the other. Mm -hmm. And I remember just tapping into some of the media last year and really based on what I would search or look at, I could easily see, okay, this side is evil or that side is evil. It Mm -hmm. just depends on where I was getting my information. Yep. Um, You know, how does somebody actually begin to do research but not fall into an echo chamber where they're just getting the information that already feeds that preconceived notion? Yeah. Well, I think the most important part regardless of where you're getting your information from is to understand that I would I think it's 96% of all media mainstream media is controlled by I think it's three main corporations hmm. so while there is the illusion of choice it's I mean even Fox News it it's literally owned by the same companies that everything else is so you don't have things that are mainstream that are going to be getting to the root of it. Um, But the most important thing to remember is that you have to be a critical thinker. You have to use your own mind to be discerning in what you're reading and understand that there's probably some kind of goal in whatever you're reading. And you need to take a step back from that goal. And, you know, I mean, I check in with my gut constantly. If I'm reading something, if I'm doing something, if I am somewhere, it doesn't matter. You have to constantly check in with yourself and say, does this feel right? Is this, is this really what's, what they're, what they're um, telling us here? Or is there an underlying goal that I'm not seeing? So I think it's important wherever you're looking to just constantly keep in your mind that, okay, I have to think critically about this and not just take it at face value. Sounds really hard. Sounds like extra work. Isn't it easier just to just let other people think for me, though? <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You're making me work harder now. Critical thinking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you said check in with your gut. And that's something that I feel like where we're at in life, mm-hmm. you know, with nutrition and with the ability to clear our thoughts, mm-hmm. um, sometimes our, you know, it can be more challenging to listen to your gut and have, you have to make that decision. Is this my, my gut? And, and there's even, I heard something really interesting about that being called your limbic brain. Mm-hmm. That is something we used to use yeah. a long time ago that we evolved away from. So it's actually a, a thinking center. Yeah. But you can bury it with food and you can bury it with uh, alcohol or substances or anything like that. Sure. Um, and, and sometimes it can be, you know, my experience was like, okay, I'm scared of this thing. Is this my gut telling me to run away? But it's actually not. It's it's fear. So you have to be able to, mm-hmm. like you said, discern mm-hmm. things. And, and how do you make that decision? Is this fear or is this my gut? Right. Well, there's a concept. Uh, I forget where I read it years ago. But you have in your mind all these little voices, right? Mm. <laughs> so you have the first response, which is generally going to be fear-based if you're in a situation that would you know, create that or, um, and then you have your second voice, which is generally going to be a little bit more reasonable, maybe the, the middle man between the two extremes. And then, you know, it goes so on and so forth until you reach like a true unbiased little voice inside of your head. Mm. So I, I mean, if I'm in, um, an uncomfortable situation in any way, shape or form, I try to separate that first responder voice and say, you know what? Thanks for your opinion, (laughs) but I'm going to try to overcome this uncomfortability. Let's go to the next voice and see what that one has to say. Yeah. And especially if you're, you know, you're talking about growing up in a certain environment, there Mm -hmm. were things that I was taught, you know, Hey, these are the facts. I laugh. I love my, one of my grandmas to death. And she would say, like, curiosity killed the cat. So mm-hmm. that was programmed into me to not be mm-hmm. curious. But I always had this piece of me. I was like, no, I, I want to know. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and knowing when to press an issue and when not to press an issue. Mm-hmm. So 
that first responder voice, I think, that you're talking about can sometimes be that belief that was passed on to us. Sure. Not necessarily helpful or serving, and we have to learn how to challenge and, and shift that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think the more you check in and the more you get used to doing that, it, it becomes easier. A- absolutely. I mean, just over time, you learn to just ignore that first responder voice, and then it takes the back seat, and it's not even it's not even the first voice anymore. <laughs> yeah. It's like a distant, um, distant thing. I had some of those voices creep back up on me this last year, Really? which was really interesting. I talked to a few other people as well, mm-hmm. you know, and, uh, oh man, I thought I had a discipline or a routine that had battled this. And then the whole world changes and you go, Hey, where did this voice come from? Like, <laughs> why is this thing back? I thought I had defeated it Yeah. once upon a time. Did you have anything like that or you? Well, I, the one thing I would say is that first off, I was extremely excited to be able to stay in more so and focus Mm. because that to me is like, okay, I can get a ton of work done. This is great. I'm thrilled. Um, obviously with the balance of going outside and being in nature, right? So (laughs) the one thing I would say is that I get too focused and I get obsessed with whatever it is I'm working on and then don't want to take that 10 minute walk, 15 minute walk, two hour hike in the middle of the week. And, you know, and then I just lose sight of that and I get, you know, totally locked into whatever it is I'm doing, which is great for work if you need to accomplish something. But I find the more you balance that work with being outside and being in nature and moving, I mean, movement is so important, especially if you're sitting at a desk at a computer uh, and, you know, even down to my eyes, like getting out and just seeing something that's not right in front of my face, <laughs> that, that is the absolute best scenario is creating that balance. So I did lose a little sight of that, <laughs> but other than that, um, I spent a lot of time just calling down my space and making it so that there were no distractions. I know we talked about that a little bit mm-hmm. with the minimalism thing. So yeah, that it was extremely beneficial to me and still is. Yeah, we only have so much focus to give. And so mm-hmm. the less there is to think about, you know, on, yeah. on one hand, when you talk about locking in and being focused, I mean, that is a, a gift that we have an ability to do and and channel all that energy to produce yeah. something great as, as people. You know, a lot of other animals in the kingdom here don't, don't necessarily have that yeah. uh, capability, but then... Sometimes the inspiration or the solution or the next move comes from that walk, you know, through nature oh, sure. or petting the dog or yep. whatever that might be. So you're 33, mm-hmm. New York liberal upbringing. Yep. You're currently in Southern California, not mm-hmm. known for its very conservative nature mm-hmm. by any means, although there are parts when you look at how people voted. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very interesting to see just the the grouping of, of where those votes came from mm-hmm. heavily in, in large cities, L.A., yep. uh, San Diego, San Francisco. But outside of that, California is very conservative. It is. What, what's it like here living for you uh, with your business and, and your beliefs? Sure. Well, the town I live in, Temecula, is extremely conservative. Uh, I had a little experience the other day just going into a coffee shop and a woman online saw my license plates and she was like, New York? I was like, yeah. She's like, did Cuomo drive you out? I was like, no, the whole state. She's (laughs) like, welcome to California. (laughs) Mm. So in a way, I mean, even though California is known for being extremely liberal, it's not where I live. That's for sure. And... I feel like the whole attitude of California is much more laid back. There's a level of emotionality and extremism in New York that I haven't found here, to be completely honest. Um, When I first got here, I had to do a lot of slowing down. (laughs) I'm like, what is going on? I'm running around, everyone. Why is everyone so slow? Why does it take so long for people to you know, interact, what is happening? And then, you know, I calmed down a little bit, Mm. got a pair of leisure pants that I hadn't owned before, you know, so (laughs) getting uh, Uh. used to that tempo is really good for me being Mm. an intense person. So 
I would say as a whole, California is actually a lot more relaxed in general about politics and, you know, everything, mm. really. I I find that kind of amazing. Actually, mm-hmm. I do agree in terms of like the slow rolling mm-hmm. energy. I still do that sometimes. Like I'm very, most people have mentioned at some point talking about like where where would we live that I belong in like an LA or in New York because mm-hmm. I can move super fast. Yeah. Um, but it is a, it's like a, a chill intensity, I guess we could call it, where yeah. it's a strong energy, but it is a different tempo. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I wonder if that's like a, like, are you, are you basing primarily those thoughts off of like your environment in Temecula or you think just traveling around California? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I've done, you know, I've done some exploring. I haven't spent a lot of time in LA, which is where I hear the major concentration is. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, just in the surrounding areas all along the coast, so far, everyone's been very amenable. I have a, one of our designs on the back of my car. My car hasn't been smashed yet. So. Okay. <laughs> So that's a good thing. I have to check this thing out. Yeah. I have to do a little bit of digging <laughs> on your on your projects. Yeah. But, uh, and I do, I find that too. I mean, we're in La Jolla. Mm-hmm. And La Jolla mm-hmm. is, is known for, I mean, it's a, a very wealthy community. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have people that are, are fiscally very conservative. Sure. And want to guard taxes and, and yep. the community and things like that. And on the other hand, uh you know, don't have a, a large say in the in the states, mm-hmm. uh, how the how the state votes, and so you you find little pockets of it. Um, in San Diego, if you go to Ocean Beach, very very liberal, mm-hmm. you know, but throughout the community, and so I, I almost wonder there was a one of the states, and I'm not like highly intelligent around exactly the politics. Every time I look at it, I'm like, okay, like this makes sense for now. Like I understand gerrymandering. Mm-hmm. Um, things like that, but uh, like the electoral votes. There are a couple states, I believe, where it's not all or nothing, Mm -hmm. that they actually get to divvy up their electoral votes Mm -hmm. based on what the population wants. Yeah. Are you familiar with like... A little bit. Um, I honestly, I need to do a lot more research (laughs) on that stuff to be able to speak to it intelligibly, Mm -hmm. but I I would say... um, you know, I mean, obviously the cities with a larger population have a lar- larger, you know, say because they have more electoral votes. So, yeah. yeah. But I don't know about how that gets divvied up within the state. Yeah. I just think there's a, a large percentage of California that's not represented mm-hmm. in terms of sure. uh, deciding uh, a president mm-hmm. or, or things like that. Yeah. So going back to your, you know, protecting the right to bear arms mm-hmm. and I, I believe there's significance in that. I mean, the gun debate is is huge. It's and huge. I try to look at, you know, where have these things been done before versus like trying to guess, oh, what, I wonder what's going to happen or, or it'll mm-hmm. for sure go this way. I don't have a crystal ball. And I think right. sometimes in politics, business, people in general, in fact, there's a psychological term about this called fortune telling mm-hmm. where you <laughs> go, uh, oh, this is for sure what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And you can look at, countries or other places like i think it's uh you know certain parts of of england or maybe all of england that have a lot of knife violence Mm -hmm. um australia perhaps and and brazil Mm -hmm. you know there's a no gun rule in brazil that's one of the most dangerous places on the planet it is so how do you you know how do you see the the right to bear arms as being something that's significant and important for for americans sure so the fact is that guns exist, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I would love it if they didn't, right? And it was a more peaceful world where they didn't exist, but they do. So the fact that they exist means that if you want to protect yourself in an instance of danger, whatever that might be, you will need to be on the same level of any kind of, you know, anybody that would be trying to cause harm, right? Right. Um, An example that I like to use is if you have a school zone, right, and there's a sign that says gun-free zone, and there's somebody that wants to shoot up that school, if they see that sign, they're going to think, okay, well, I'm good to go. There's nothing that's going to be in my way. If there's a sign that says guarded area Mm -hmm. or something of that nature, they're going to think twice about it because they know that 
this area is protected and they're not just going to be able to have their way as a free for all. Um, so, you know, if you think about it that way in that, yes, guns exist. Yes. Not everybody in the world is good natured, unfortunately. Um, and you know, you want to be in control of your life and whatever scenario may occur. Uh, I think the best way is to own a gun. And I mean, having lived in a lot of different places in the United States, including New Orleans and, um, you know, other big cities, Manhattan, you know, being a female, I am very adventurous and I like to go places by myself mm -hmm. and I did not carry a weapon. And it, at those times in my life when I was, you know, going places late at night to go find a drum and bass dance club in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, I, I, feel very grateful that nothing has ever happened to me, but there are times where I wish I did have a weapon just in case, you know, something would have happened. Um, I did have some close calls in New Orleans, like being followed on my bicycle, you know, by a vehicle with shaded windows, like just going right at the speed of my bike. And I figured out other ways to work around that, um, so that I wouldn't be followed. I just started dressing up like a crazy person and it oh, never really? happened again. Okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That was a fun one. Uh, um, yeah. I worked at a restaurant in the French quarter and then lived in the lower ninth ward and I would ride my bicycle back home from the graveyard shift. It was right across from the stadium. And you know, I would wear my waitressing outfit home like a naive country bumpkin, not mm -hmm. thinking like maybe you shouldn't wear that. So I started wearing pajama pants tucked into <laughs> combat boots uh, with a huge camo <laughs> hoodie and a crazy hat and like messing up my hair. Never got followed again. <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, oh my gosh, that poor lady needs a dollar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that uh, worked. And, you know, there's obviously ways to innovate if you so choose to avoid any kind of harm or danger as a young female. But I would say, you know, if just in my life, you know, I had a weapon, I would feel more secure in being the adventurous person I wanted to be, you know, uh -huh. in those adventures. And, you know, like I said, there's plenty of ways to avoid danger. That's the first goal. <laughs> But if you're in a situation or a scenario where there's somebody else who wants to cause harm, you can prevent that from happening, not necessarily by even using a weapon, but just mm. by having one and yeah. showing them that you have one. Um, so, you know, I think it's important that good natured people that want to protect their loved ones and their family and other good people, um, that they own weapons so that they can prevent dangerous things from happening. Yeah, I think that, I mean, it just seems so reasonable and fair when you describe it. And then obviously there's a, a story on the other side of that that people go, well, no, it's not right. Like it causes more harm. And mm -hmm. and so, I mean, I automatically think when I think of a criminal, mm -hmm. you know, someone that is disobeying the law, mm -hmm. I, I haven't quite heard a, a strong argument for, um, oh, well, if we ban guns, the criminals won't be able to get guns. I, I I can't imagine that. In fact, I've seen the opposite of that. You yep. know, living in Brazil, the criminals had guns, and it was less safe for people on the street. You'd be at the bus stop, and you would, uh, you know, we would carry, we'd have one pocket just call our robbery pocket. So mm -hmm. when somebody came to rob us, because you could just kind of expect that yep. throughout your course of living there, yep. that you had enough to give them so they'd be happy and go away, and you'd have to give all your belongings away. Yep. Um, you know, I, I can't, I can't see a world in the U.S. anyways where criminals are not going to be able to do damage just because the average person right. doesn't have these weapons. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's been proven time and time again. You take away gun rights and then they're just going to get them on the black market or from, you know, an illegal deal. And then you have more crime because all of those dealings are going to be shady, you know? So if it's already underneath the law, then they can do whatever they want as far as, okay, they're doing a gun deal and then, oh, let me just shoot up this guy and I'll take all the guns. You know, I mean, it just gets messy. <laughs> yeah, and I think we're actually seeing this in uh, plant medicine or, or drugs. And I think drug is a strange term because, uh, you know, you mentioned plant medicine earlier. Mm -hmm. We're looking at, I've been really paying close attention to the psilocybin research mm -hmm. and um, those restrictions being lifted in a state like California actually saying, hey, this is a, has medical properties. We should be using this to cure depression. I think Oregon might have already done that or is mm -hmm. working on it. 
um, you know, so they were, they were labeled at one point, oh, this is evil, this is bad, uh, and the, the false beliefs on that, you know, did more harm over time where you have this, mm-hmm. you know, opioid epidemic that maybe could have been prevented with less, uh, with, with more care mm-hmm. around doing the research, being a critical thinker, right. learning about it from an open and, and flexible perspective. Yeah. Well, I will say that, you know, when it comes to opioids, that, you know, doctors are pill pushers for the most part. In my experience for Western medicine, what's wrong? Oh, do you want a pill? No, I don't. So, I mean, that's a way for them to make money. And I feel like part of the censorship on psychedelics or plant medicine or anything that is not something they can make money off of or profit from, those are the things that are banned, right? So, I mean, it goes way, way back to, I believe, early 1700s when they banned hemp, you know, for use on rope and fuel because they couldn't profit off of it. So, you know, we're faced with that same situation nowadays when it comes to medicine. And, you know, as far as psychedelics go, or anything really, it's all about the dosage. So you can go from a micro dose of a psychedelic and have something that's extremely beneficial to somebody's anxiety or depression to a lethal dose. You know, I mean, I don't know if you can actually die from psychedelics, but I would say, you know, you might think you can fly and jump off of a building. Mm -hmm. But (laughs) so when it comes to that stuff, just banning it outright is not the, the answer. I believe that being safe and knowledgeable about it and understanding what the effects are and what the dosages are can be extremely beneficial in many ways for many different ailments. And that's absolutely what they're, what they're proving now. And you, mm-hmm. when you hear a name like Johns Hopkins, it just has so much weight in the medical community come out with a study that says, Hey, one dosage of this done in a, the right environment, mm-hmm. um, can cure someone of PTSD and depression for mm-hmm. six months you know, automatically there's someone that hears that and goes, uh, like the, this goes against the story I've been telling myself for so long. There's a little yeah. fly floating around there. Hey buddy, get out of here. I, get it? <laughs> I know I saw it just like, like a little <laughs> jet fighter right in you. Um, but it, it goes, uh, it goes back to what you were talking about with uh, emotional or rational thinking. Mm-hmm. It, it's fair to say that a decent percentage of people to guard their beliefs that they have been living by, you know, here's something in opposition to that, whether it's politics or religion or plant medicine, shut it down super fast yep. because, oh my gosh, wait, that means I've been wrong. Right. And I have an ego. And so if I'm wrong, that means my ego could take some damage. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, that was a huge experience to go through being red pilled. I mean, it was basically like a complete ego crisis to go through, to think, whoa, everything that I was thinking was like the good thing to do and the right Mm. thing to do. I mean, to, to realize that some of those things were not the right thing to do or, you know, the most loving, caring thing to do was really hard. You know, you go through, I mean, I went through months and months and months of just like, totally second guessing everything, like basically wiping the slate clean and being like, okay, I need to take a step back and look at everything, not just politics, but if I thought for all these other things to be true, and now I'm realizing with a little bit of research and effort, like maybe not, what what about everything else, you know? (laughs) So taking a step back again, I mean, that is just the most important thing. And, you know, being aware and just like I said before, too, being a critical thinker and not being guided by one idea or one philosophy or one way of living because you have to be able to pivot in life. You have to be flexible. You have to be open to change because it's going to happen regardless. Yeah, The world keeps moving. It's rotating. Yep. It's a giant rock. We're yep. in outer space. There's a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> yeah. Like move with it or get stuck. That's right. When you were going through that or even kind of during or after, like mm-hmm. what happened to the relationships around you? I lost a lot of friends. I did. I became very 
indifferent when it came to politics in the beginning. And the fact that I wasn't going along with everybody else around me made them just completely shut me out. Uh, and that was also very difficult going through that tough time and people just saying, well, I'm not going to be friends with you if you don't believe what I believe. So, and still to this day, I've lost several friends. Um, and it's funny because my best friend of 25 years that I'm with here in California, she does not share the same political beliefs as I do, but she'll do fun experiments, you know, to be in my shoes and like, we'll go out for a night on the town and she'll pretend to be more on the conservative side just to see what it would be like for me. And mm. she did that in New York and felt what it was like to be faced with anger and intolerance and all of these things. So, you know, this division, this extreme division that we have now, I think is completely uncalled for. I think if you really love and care about a person, it doesn't matter what their beliefs are. And you can always find some kind of common ground to understand each other. And honestly, most of the time, everybody's coming from the same place and they want the same things. They just go about it in a different way because of their upbringing or their environment or what they know. So, you know, when it comes down to it, I, for me, like if somebody else in my life doesn't think the same way, there's absolutely no way that I would just shut them out of my life because that's another way that you can really truly practice critical thinking is to have people around you that don't think the same thing. Yeah. I think it's even actually important to it have is. that, uh, you know, you have to challenge your thoughts. I think your, your, our thinking is like a, like a gym, you know, Yeah. it is, if you don't exercise it and you just do this one thing, like if I just go to the gym and do bicep curls every day for the next 10 years, I'm going to have really strong arms, but my body's going to be out of whack and, you know, there's probably going to be some other just weird things that pop up. And then, you know, one day somebody says, by the way, you know, having big biceps doesn't make you strong. No, <laughs> yeah. you know, I should have been doing all these other things. So we have to exercise those thoughts, challenge them. Um, one of my favorite uh, things to remind myself and those around me is that the uh, ability to hold two opposing beliefs mm -hmm. um, is a sign of intelligence. And I've had people get immediately offended when I said <laughs> that. And I love it. I'm like, well, all right. Uh, you know, go for it. But it, it sounds like that's something that you do quite often is mm -hmm. also put yourself in someone else's shoes and look at it from their perspective. Have sure. you, have you always been like that? Or is that something that you developed through this journey? I would say that I've always kind of been like that. Um, not to the extreme that I am now, but I, as a person am somewhat of, um, an ironic combination of things. <laughs> So, you know, you know, just as an example, being uh, more on the conservative side and then also extremely artistic, like those are two <laughs> things that don't usually go together. Mm -hmm. Being very, you know, easygoing, but also really high strung and like full of energy. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I am, you know, uh, a bit of a, uh, you know, just a strange combination of things that, you know, aren't necessarily things that go together. So I try to, like you said, just be aware um, and in the present moment and take what anything that's, take anything that's presented to me and try to understand it and, you know, sit with it, mull it around, let it percolate and see, is there going to be something that you can gain from that? Because I, I truly believe that all of the things we're presented with in life are there to show us something, whether it's a larger lesson or a mini lesson or something that you can benefit from, whether it's uncomfortable or not. <laughs> you know, if you take the time and give it the energy to distill whatever it is you need to distill, I feel like life is worthwhile and you know you're getting the most out of it yeah and um, you know the ironic or the contradictions I, I immediately thought of just some people around me and, and i find that it's very common for people that are either highly successful and successful is a weird word to define because it means so many different things to so many different people mm -hmm. but you know oftentimes associated with wealth or, or financial um means but uh, some of the, the people that I know, and you wouldn't guess it when you watch them speak to a group or you hear them operate behind the scenes, are very anxious or, or anxiety. So I don't even really like the word anxiety. I generally call it energy. Mm -hmm. And it's energy that 
is looking to be channeled yes. somewhere. And once we crack the code on ourselves on, on what it takes for us to bottle that and, and put it into certain things, a, a lot of beautiful stuff comes out of it. Um, the lessons that we learned too. I mean, one of my really funny things, we were talking about this rib. There's a strong chance I broke a rib the, like a week ago from being a dodo. <laughs> like just wearing, you know, just all like a bunch of different factors. And I could easily go, oh, you know, it wasn't my fault. And it was this and it was the shoes and it was the slimy rocks. And it was, you know, I could have ignored the fact that I was playing on my phone, dancing around a little bit, not paying attention to my surroundings, uh, just having a good time, but being a little bit like not aware of what's going on. And, and I know better than that. And so I can look at every significant injury I've had from an ACL tear to destroying my left knee or wrapping around a tree snowboarding, um, broken ribs, uh, this one broken rib, each one of those, like that hand right there, you know, popping the bone out of the top of it, Mm -hmm. every single one of them had a strong lesson with them. And, uh, he kind of reminds you of saying that. I'm like, yeah, you know, yeah. The, the painful, sometimes it's a physical pain. Sure. Hopefully people aren't getting as injured as, as much as I have been. <laughs> but um, the emotional mm-hmm. pain or tie with that too. But you you have to be able to accept that and be accountable for it too. Right. That's what I was going to say is if you are able to take responsibility <laughs> for it, you can then learn from that. You know, but if you just place blame elsewhere, you're never going to be able to learn that lesson. Yeah, you're. Sounds like you want people to like be do hard things. <laughs> Why can't I just sit around and blame other people and like not be accountable and not have to use my brain? Gosh, um, yeah. <laughs> do you find that you attract uh, people in your life that are very similar? Occasionally, yeah. Uh, I like to surround myself with like-minded people, you know, that are go-getters that want to do the work. It doesn't always happen that way. Um, but I keep my circle somewhat small. Uh, I don't have a lot of, you know, free time for gallivanting like I used to. So, uh, but, (laughs) okay. (laughs) but yeah, the, you know, the best environment to be in, if I'm, you know, in a place where I'm working on myself, is not necessarily just being around someone that's in that same space because you can get a lot from helping other people too. And whether that's helping somebody emotionally or, you know, to work through something they're going, that's going on in their life. I think that that's also very beneficial and that you shouldn't, uh, you know, choose the people you surround yourself with solely based on where they're at in life because, Everybody has unlimited potential. It's just whether or not they tap into that. And by your own embodiment of those principles, taking responsibility and so on and so forth, you can you can help people rocket themselves to their own next levels. And it doesn't mean that, you know, they're stuck in one place if they're willing to do the work. Yeah, and that's a, a challenging thing is that I had to learn, you know, um, when to give and when not to give, Mm -hmm. you know, not everybody's ready for that. You can enable people to never really elevate their circumstances. Do you have a a formula or some kind of a template on, on when to give and when to really guard your, guard your own rights? Well, I think it's very simple to be honest. Uh, if the person is looking for help, they will express it to you. Hmm. And the only other way that I try to help people on a regular basis is just through embodiment of those principles, like I said, because most of the time, you know, if somebody's battling with something, whether it's an alcoholic or somebody with drug addiction, if you tell them, hey, you're an alcoholic, like, how do we, how do we get through this? Like, (laughs) do you want to, you know, do you want to work on this? They don't, they don't want to hear that. They're, they're happy and they're comfortable wherever they are. And when you present something like that, they get defensive. So if, you know, you make it known that you're caring and you want to help without saying, hey, you're an alcoholic, they'll come to you when they're ready, you know, because you can't, phys- you can't change somebody. 
you know, like the person has to really want it themselves or it's not going to happen. And I mean, that's the truth beyond any kind of addiction. It's the same is true for emotion. Yeah, there's this really cool guy here in San Diego named Dan Negroni, and he's like a big time coach, and um, he works with like Qualcomm, all these really big mm -hmm. companies. He's a super awesome guy. Uh, gone out to like eat with him, or went to work out at Orange Theory Fitness with him, and everybody's like, "Dan!" Like he's just like a rock star when yeah. he goes places. And one of the lessons he passed to me in the last few years is like honesty that kills is still murder. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh. Because, I, you know, I've kind of gone back and forth with the, is this saying too much to this person? Is this not saying enough? Like, when are they going to be ready for it? And is a, I think, a skill to be able to recognize when to share with uh, somebody, mm -hmm. you know, something that, that can help move them forward. Sure. Yeah, and I think, you know, obviously it depends on the person and, you know, just really being in touch with where that person's at and feeling mm. where they're feeling and trying to put yourself in their shoes to understand, you know, where they're coming from. I mean, you can always start smaller and, you know, drop a little hint and see how they <laughs> respond without, like, you know, giving a full dose. But, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, you know, I think there's always a way to express honesty and truth in a caring, loving way, you know, taking the, um, the most loving route that you possibly can, which generally is going to be received much better. What do you think prevents people from, from receiving it sometimes though? Like what, what's going on there when, you know, they have a problem, it's repetitive and, yeah. you know, they're not being accountable and it's like very clear. It's usually very clear to the people around them. Hey, right you know, stop dating people like this yeah. or, you know, stop, uh, whatever it is. Yeah. So I truly believe that everyone <laughs> is on their own individual journey mm -hmm. and that, you know, in the same situation or scenario that we were just talking about, they need to learn that lesson on their own and they'll do it when they're ready. Mm. And to, you know, it's really important if you want to inspire somebody, you have to take your own emotions that are attached to them advancing and cut that off and say, this person's going to do it when they're ready. That's their journey. And that's okay. Uh, and that's hard to do sometimes, but it's, if you can accept that and you are just, like I said, present for when they do need help and you make, make it known that you're there for them and that, you know, you love them and you will help them any way they can, they'll come to you when they're ready. But, you know, forcing change on somebody or trying to force them to see a lesson is generally not going to help if they're not ready to see that. I've had that in, in relationships, like really great relationships that ended up being the, the deal breaker. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it, has perplexed some people around me. Like it just, you know, like you guys ended and we'd walk through it and they're like, wow, you know, that that's strong. And then six months later I get a novel of a text message, uh, like with gratitude and, and thank you kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And, uh, it is interesting when, when we're ready for it though, yeah. what are some, some moments you have had like that? Maybe it was like a repeated, lesson you're like oh this thing again <laughs> or do you have any is there one moment that really stands out as like this is one of the biggest lessons I learned in life hmm. yeah well uh, as a constantly changing and evolving person there's many um, I'm trying to think <laughs> of one that might be a good story uh, I think you know one that sticks out is really just being a naive country bumpkin as I mentioned before because you know, when you grow up in a small town in the country and you don't have the same exposure that you do to regular culture in a city, uh, that was a lesson I knew I needed to learn, but I didn't know how to do it. So I just plopped myself right in the middle of the city, whether it was Manhattan or, you know, somewhere else. So it was something that I knew I had, I it was learning it as I went and I still didn't really get to the end of what that lesson was until like maybe a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, that was one of the things like being in a big city was one of the things that had caused me anxiety in the past. And 
being somebody that wants to do, you know, work on myself on a regular basis, I seek out those uncomfortable situations and I put myself in them mm -hmm. to overcome it. So, you know, living in Manhattan on and off for four years was difficult, extremely difficult in the beginning. Uh, and then when I just finally began to become comfortable with it, you know, I had to zero it in and say, okay, like you can't let the anxiety get to you to a point where you're going to miss your turn every single time, mm. you know? So really just fine tuning it and continually putting myself in those uncomfortable positions until it became comfortable. Yeah. When you're talking about the driving thing, like parallel parking, yeah. it's the weirdest thing. Yeah. I did it on my driver's test in the area I grew up in. I've done it a bunch. And for a good chunk of my driving life, something that caused me crazy anxiety. Mm -hmm. The other day I'm, I'm actually I'm like, oh, I'm, I usually uh, I'm going to like underground top secret hot yoga because I don't think they're allowed to be open right now. So it's, right. it's very top secret. Yeah. Um, it's full of doctors, by the way, <laughs> if that helps anything. <laughs> Uh, it's like I go in there and there's like all these like medical professionals and people right. are running large portions of healthcare and I'm like, okay. Mm. Anyways, uh, <laughs> I'm super happy that the business is able to survive in a smart way. Yeah. But, uh, so I usually try to go like, I mean, the classes are packed. It's crazy how many yeah. people are in these classes right now. Um, and so I'm going and I want to get there like 15, 15 minutes early, you know, sure. make sure I have a good spot. I like to kind of, I don't mind getting there early, spend extra time and making sure I have my space, my room. Yeah. You know? And so I'm like, okay, I'm going a little bit faster than normal. Cause I'm like, oh, if I don't get there soon enough, I'm going to be crammed between <laughs> the people that are more sweaty than me perhaps. Right. And uh, there's only one spot like in the whole block and I'm like driving around the block and it was parallel parking. And I just was like, all right, it was a kind of a tight spot, but I was so like in a good place mm -hmm. and not even really thinking about it that I didn't use any of my normal tactics. I'm like, Oh, I have to go left. I have to go do this. I have to pull the mirror halfway. Mm -hmm. And I just like whipped it around, popped in the spot. And it was probably the most perfect parallel parking I'd ever done with no anxiety. That's awesome. And I'm like, why is this different than the 1000 other times mm -hmm. um, where I felt pressure or anxiety? Have, have you found well, I think being prepared is a huge thing. If you have the pressure of time and you were in that same mm -hmm. scenario, that might have caused some anxiety, but being prepared as much as you can be, that always helps eliminate anxiety. You know, especially if you're driving around in a city, that, that you know, giving yourself extra time, you never know when you're going to hit traffic and all that stuff. Yeah, being prepared definitely helps to eliminate that. And also just being in a good place, doing whatever it is that you need to feel happy and feel good in your body and doing that so you can be in a good place to operate from. I mean, I think a huge part of that in my life is just eliminating stress, whatever that could be. You know, it could be that even coffee makes me a little too much. Mm. So maybe come back on the coffee and switch to tea sometimes, you know, however you can eliminate that stress. Moving to California was a huge part of that for me. <laughs> Just being in beautiful weather makes me a much happier person. Not having to, you know, be frigid outside with the rain and the snow. Let's see, it's freaking, this is a cold yeah. winter day and the clouds <laughs> just burned off. So yeah, that is, that is big. You know, we um, were talking a little bit about like staying up late and, yeah. and routines and things like that. Have you... Do you have a routine that you're just, you know, nine out of 10 days or a or hundred out of a hundred days that is, this is your routine no matter what? Yeah. Well, being uh, an aging female skincare routine, no doubt about that. hundred <laughs> um, percent. But <laughs> sleep, I'm not so great on. I definitely end up staying up late more often than not. As far as, you know, taking care of myself, uh, you know, just uh, in terms of supplements and whatnot, I am 100% of the time on that as well to just be my optimal physical self. Uh, but I would say, you know, it's always a work in progress. All the other disciplines, you know, the ones that are not extremely uh, imperative, I will keep that going as a work in progress and just try to achieve it as much as I possibly can. Yeah, what about all those, like a... This is something I've been experimenting with lately as a nighttime routine. Uh -huh. I realize I, I've had one for a while, but it hasn't been anything more than close up shop, close the curtains, yeah, like you know, turn the lights off, yeah. go to sleep. And I've been trying these like little nighttime elixirs, like turmeric and mm -hmm. coconut milk. I don't, I don't think my body is meant to have 
anything to process while mm-hmm. sleeping, so I don't think that worked out too well for me. But, um, yeah, do you have anything like that, like a nighttime thing too? Yeah, well, one thing, I don't do it regularly, but one thing I try to do either at in the evening or in the daytime is just to do a back roll because that, mm. like, really helps me sleep better and just be more relaxed. Um, that's super helpful. Um, I mean, one thing that I try to stick to, this is both evening and morning, is do not be on a device mm. before you go to sleep mm. and first thing when you wake up. Mm-hmm. Keep those things away from you. I even put it in the other room. I put my computer in the other room because I don't want it anywhere near my head when I'm going to sleep. <laughs> uh, and, you know, sometimes I'll even go as far as turning the Wi-Fi off at night. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I just I think it's really important to be with your own thoughts and to process those, especially when you are going to sleep because that's kind of the natural progression before you fall into the dream state. So I think it's really important not to only not have the blue light exposure, but to just let your mind do its thing. Yeah. Let it be a brain for a little bit. Yeah. This dream state too, you, you, we were talking about this a little bit before and I couldn't even remember the last time I remembered a dream. I mean, it, eh, it's not fair. It would have been a year ago, something like that, but it's not sure. something I've, I've thought much about lately. And then lo and behold, the day after, maybe, I think you mentioned that to me, I had a crazy dream and I remembered I woke up and I was like, whoa, what just happened? Wow. I had like Uncle Phil from uh, Will's, what was that show with Will Smith? Oh my gosh, Fresh Prince. Oh, sure. I had like Uncle Phil from Fresh <laughs> Prince in it and we were going through this Mexican drive through but we were walking and he walked up and ordered a burrito like right in the speaker. It was a crazy dream. It was That's super hilarious. fun. But um, yeah, wh- what's your take on, on dreaming and... Sure. So I absolutely love dreaming. I try as much as I can to remember those dreams. And I have a couple of little tricks that I use. Uh, Mm -hmm. One of them is to keep your eyes closed when you wake up. Just keep them shut, even though you're awake. Mm -hmm. Don't open them and do a dream recap. Because for some reason, maybe this is just me, as soon as I open my eyes, they fly out of my mind. Mm. So I try to do that before I write something down. I do try to write things down if it seems meaningful. Uh, I have written down dreams from years ago, even up to 10, 15 years ago that have had significance many years later and or little things I needed to decode that then made sense years later. So I find that dreams as a whole can be extremely informative, not just about your own psyche, but about your future, different versions of yourself. Mm. I mean, if you learn to control your dreams, also known as lucid dreaming, you can see anyone you want, you can go anywhere you want, you can do anything you want. This includes not having a physical body. So the possibilities are endless. And I just find that there's a lot of valuable information there that we can glean. So this is something you've obviously spent some time on. Sure. Uh, Is this a daily or I should say nightly practice for you? It depends. Uh, If I'm doing really well, you know, having, you know, a couple of square meals and getting enough sleep and doing things I need to do to feel good, then yes, I'll generally have insane dreams. Hmm. Uh, But if I... And staying up super late and distracted and doing a million things, I generally don't remember them. Uh, One of the little tips that I use for lucid dreaming, which is when you're actually aware that you are dreaming in the dream, uh, is to just look at your hands before you go to sleep. Very simple. Uh, The purpose is that if you can focus on any one thing in your dreams, you realize you're dreaming because it's not a solid state. So the first time I looked at my hands, they're all bubbling and weird, and I'm like, Okay, that's a dream. Hmm. Got it. Another thing you can do is look at a clock. Uh, Just, again, focusing on one particular thing, really, truly, you can understand in a moment that you're actually dreaming. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I know some people that say they never remember their dreams, and some people that say they dream all the time. And um, there's this really, I worked at a bank in like my early 20s for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And there was a lady named Stephanie Duran, and she was the dream weaver. And she had this radio show, and people would call in, and she would just guide them through their dreams. And wow. I mean, she made out, yeah, it was kind of interesting to, for me. It was like one of my first experiences of someone like took something like dreaming 
and made this like lifelong career out of like a radio show. It was just really cool. That's awesome. To see. So yeah. what um what got you into dreams? Well, I've had pretty insane dreams from the time I was young. Uh everything from meeting mystical beings in the woods that then pass me gifts that are magical. Okay, we need a little more detail on that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the one I'm referencing there, I was walking through the woods mm -hmm. and I was led to this tent, if you will, made out of natural uh, skins, animal skins mm -hmm. and wood. <laughs> and I go into the tent and there's this, uh, there's a little tiny fire in the center and there's this little girl who's probably eight or nine, uh, also covered in furs and what looks like Native American designs on blankets in addition to the furs. And she's sitting in the middle. And although she appeared to be a little girl, I knew in my spirit that she was an elder mm. and very, very wise. And I had found in the woods when I was walking into this tent, this stick and I knew, for whatever reason, that the stick had magical powers. And I went to give it to her, and I said, "Here, you know, here's this." She said, "No, that's for you." So I walked out with the stick, and you know, it's just an average stick, but it had two prongs. And as soon as I walked out of the tent, you know, I said, "Thank you so much. I understand what I'm supposed to do with this." Walked out, and the stick started emanating. I wouldn't call it streams of light. It was more like the way a water droplet falls on the water and the concentric rings emanate. It mm. was sort of like that, but in the air, multicolored <laughs> blue and rainbow. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was gifted this magical item that I then had to do something with. And that's all I remember. But do you still carry this thing in your dreams with you? Cause it, that sounds pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, but, uh, I do have recurring dreams. A lot of them are dystopian landscapes, Armageddon. Hmm. I have a lot of, uh, transhumanism type dreams where there's, you know, people that are willingly becoming part robotic where I'm trying to save them. What? I purposefully don't watch any dystopian films because I don't want anything else in my brain that is already there. Yeah. So yeah, I have a lot of really insane dreams where I'm always some type of ninja or force trying to save people from, mm -hmm. you know, either help them get out of the city or help them not become a robot. However that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I've fought demons. I've, I fly all the time. I've taught flying classes. <laughs> so oh, that sounds awesome. Teach yeah. me to fly. Superwoman. <laughs> yeah. oh. I actually, I had a friend that asked me if I flew in my dreams and he was one of the students in my class that had happened prior to him asking me that. Uh, wow. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So yeah. is that something that, that happens where people have shared dreams or reports yeah. of it anyways? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And I think, uh, one of the, I wouldn't say it's a proof, but one of the things that happens on psychedelics is people have shared experiences as well. Mm. And I haven't been able to pinpoint a specific dream that was exactly the same, but I have had very similar dreams uh, with other people, especially ones that I'm close to, family, best friend, things like that, where it was, you know, something like an ocean scene with dolphins. Like, I don't have those dreams too often. And mm. then when I share, you know, with my sister and she has an ocean dream with dolphins the same night, it's like, hmm, that's interesting. You know, the, the being connected topic, it's really easy to go like mystical woo woo on it. Yeah. And then to go scientific on it. But it's not even a, I remember when I first started noticing it, if I think about someone and they text me, mm -hmm. okay. All the time. You know, yeah. yeah. And it's really easy to dismiss something like that. Sure. And, you know, if I had three or four people in my life that I talked to regularly, well, okay, it's, it's bound to happen. Sure. You know, there's like 5,000 something people on my phone right now. Yeah. Uh, it's, it doesn't, it's, there's no way I can, it would be weird for yeah. me to imagine it being a coincidence at this point, but it's a little out there because we don't have... We can't put it in a lab and say that when I think of one of my nephews and they text me 30 seconds later, 
that I sent them some sort of telepathic interconnected message. Yeah. You know, like, what what is that? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I do think on some level we are all connected. And, you know, the people that you spend a lot of time with and maybe not even spend a lot of time with but have a really strong connection to and a deep love for them, I feel like the communication, otherworldly communication, is the channels are a little bit more open. Uh, Yeah, I mean, it happens to me on a regular basis and you think, okay, well, this happens too often to be a coincidence at this point. Yeah. The lady that made that, the light code painting over there that we were talking about, Mm -hmm. um, her and I were chatting about, uh, because she's like a psychic and has a lot of stuff going on. It's pretty cool. And uh, the difference between like a, in her world, what she calls like a twin flame versus Mm -hmm. a soulmate and how they're different and things like that. And I, may have this a little bit mixed up, but essentially a a twin flame is someone that ignites the craziness in you. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, as you were talking about like someone with a strong love connection, you know, you Mm -hmm. you hear sometimes about those relationships where one person wants to be done with it, but there's this like massive pool of emotion and energy and love. And, um, you know, that kind of a connection is, is very strong, but then you have people that maybe you've, had hardly like in, in this case one example she was sharing with me like barely any interaction with this person and there was a a super strong crazy connection it makes me think about you know true my understanding of karma where everybody's sitting around on a table before they become a human and they're like all right i'm gonna teach you this lesson and over here you're gonna go through that yep and then you you also see samples of that like if you look at the mormon church you know they believe essentially that we were from another planet Mm-hmm. and uh, like spiritual planet or existence or yep. being, I might be messing it up a little bit. And then this is like our human journey before we go to, you know, some version of heaven, depending on how good we are right? Yeah. in this lifetime. So, but again, we don't have proof of this. So, you know, how is that not science fiction? How is it real? How is it that we can believe in some things but not others? Yeah. Well, uh, there are, you know, a lot of mystical experiences that people have, near-death experiences, past life regressions. I know from my own personal experience that I have spoken other languages in dreams that I don't speak. I have, (laughs) you know, been places in real life where I might understand how an object works, and I've never seen it before in my life. Like where, you know, where does that come from? I have relationships where, you know, a really good friend of mine, I've never, ever, ever been in a physical altercation in my entire life. Yet for some reason, I was compelled to choke this person when I was seven (laughs) years old. And I never, like never put my hands on another human being in my entire life. Turns out that's my best friend now, 25 years later. Wow. Like, we had some weird thing to work out from a past life. That's the only Mm. explanation I have for that. And, yeah, I mean, there's other instances in life that you just can't explain, you know? So I, I don't think we should close ourselves off to understanding the full nature of what we are in our true existence because... I certainly think that that's not a body, especially if we go to recharge our body for however many hours a night and we're not in a body anymore. That's Mm. a pretty obvious... Wait, where do we go? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. Yeah, this uh, piece of art up here, this like Egyptian papyrus thing, Mm -hmm. one of the reasons I ended up uh, purchasing that is that I have a strong recurring theme in in my life like a memory it feels like a memory and that's really interesting because you can manipulate memory you can plant seeds of memory that didn't exist Mm -hmm. and so you have to be very careful around that too Um, psychologists are known for doing this where they're prying 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 and then they create a memory Mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't there didn't even something didn't actually happen so it's a, a pretty you know strange phenomena that we that we have Um, But, like, I can legit look at that thing and feel myself being in a chariot in Egyptian times. And, like, the dirt is very real around me. There's, like, some kind of a hunt or a battle going on. Wow. And it's, uh, uh, I've had a lot of conversations about, like, that Egyptian pool. And and my name means 
a ruler of the people from that era. Huh. And yeah, so it's just it's been it's been a fun. I love names, dude. There's so much strength yeah. in names when you go back all the way through the Bible. Yeah. Um, or ask people, you know, when we look at the meaning. Do you know the meaning of your name, by any chance? I looked it up, but I don't recall honestly. It, it, I know there's something, especially because of the weird spelling, but I can't think of it at the moment. I have found, and I, I can't say that I've done this for every person I've ever met, but uh, for a select group that I have engaged in this conversation with is when we get to the root source and the origin of their name, mm -hmm. it is often in some way, shape, or form related to what they're doing currently mm -hmm. at a really high level or what they feel compelled to be doing. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it can be, you know, one of my sisters, her name is Nicole. And that means like, uh, like, an, like freer slash leader of the people, kind of like a different version. Mm -hmm. And when I look at her family unit, and you know, maybe this is like, a, oh, well, you can relate anything to anything type of thing too. Mm -hmm. But it hasn't, hasn't really seemed that way because it'd be like, well, that's not really, this doesn't fit. Or someone is unhappy in their job. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, well, yeah, if your name means this and you're unhappy with this, like, what, oh, that sounds exciting. You know, kind of tying yeah. all those dots. Sure. But I see her name planning out in the way that she like is with her family too, mm. which is neat. So we're going to have to dig into that's cool. the meaning of Jamie's <laughs> name. Um, so speaking of dreams. Mm hmm there's the dreams that happen when we're recharging our body. Mm -hmm. uh, I think of, I like to think of like the past, present and future in very particular ways. Mm -hmm. Where do you see, you know, how do you see dreams playing a role in, in the future that you're currently creating? Cause you've shared some really neat things with me. Sure. Well, I actually liken past memories, the way that we recall them uh, to a very sim similar structure as dreams. And as you said, they have that malleability where you can implant a seed. Uh, it's almost like they're so flexible in our recall, our own memories, even from early years to, for me, a month ago, uh, that you can, you can either get a really full picture. I mean, some people obviously have like full uh, photo recall, but there is this special thing that happens when it goes through the filter of your mind that you pick and choose little parts of it to remember because you know we're not actually functioning at our full brain capacity if we were to compute obviously all of the stimulus around us we would explode <laughs> mm -hmm. so uh you know i think dreams that i have when i'm sleeping the importance that they have on my future a lot of times is to just be aware and to be a warrior and to be strong and to be the best human I can be to influence my future that way. But I almost see living itself as a form of dream. It almost, I mean, it has the same uh, flexibility that we do to go anywhere or see anyone or be anything that we want in our dreams. Granted, we can't fly yet, but, <laughs> you know, I think that we have a similar flexibility there that it's really just whether or not we want to grab a hold of that and do something about it. So I almost take that lesson that I get from dreaming and try to apply that to my life. Like, well, if I'm not happy, how do I change that? Or if I really want to do this thing, go do it. So, you know, it, you know, they have um, ultimate possibilities, you know, that we do just as humans, that happens in both states. And I think being aware of that can help you live up to your full potential. I, yeah, I agree with that in, in so many ways. I think of, uh, defining that dream, you mm -hmm. know, I know someone that lives nearby and going back to our conversation earlier about helping people and you can see something so clearly mm -hmm. where they're like really trying to carve out their path in life. And I, I can see how they have like this dream and that dream and this dream and you can only have really like one dream and it has to all tie together. And so you have to build one thing and then build the next. Sometimes you can do multiple things at the same time, but they really, in my experience and opinion, have to be um, strongly Yeah related and my personal like vision in life has shifted in big ways like every so many years too you know it's like that new knowledge went oh I can change my dream like I didn't know that was possible but you yeah. also have to be willing to take that 
that leap and at our age and you're you're younger than me so you got <laughs> you got a little little extra time on the clock um i find that it can be challenging dating mm-hmm. uh, when you kind of have a dream or a vision and i honestly i look at kind of dating or getting to know somebody now is seeing how those dreams can come together and yeah. be shared what, what, what's your experience yeah, so <laughs> um, I actually, I'm on the dating apps. Uh, it's it's weirdly impersonal, you know. It's very, uh, it's not the way I want to meet somebody. But mm-hmm. uh, I actually treat it more like a networking app, to be completely honest. I, although I'm very, I'm very selective about, you know, somebody that I actually feel sparks flying with. I've met a lot of great friends and a lot of great connections that turn out to be wonderful relationships that may not be, you know, a partnership. But uh, (laughs) I think, you know, that in relationships, there's so much to be gained, whether it's even the worst date you ever had. (laughs) Mm. What is it about that person that makes you feel that way? Or how can, you know, how can you improve interactions in general to always have a good time? I... I've rarely been on a bad date. And even if it was somebody I didn't click with at all, you know, you just have to take life lightly and enjoy it and have a good time. So it is hard. It is very hard to be pursuing a dream and find somebody that you can do that with. That's the ultimate goal, you know, but a lot of times people's dreams don't align and there is a happy in between there because I Mm. I do think one of the keys to successful relationships is that both people are very focused on whatever it is and they maintain their individuality. Yeah. Like when people become a we this, we Mm. that, we everything, that's when I think things start to get messy because they lose themselves in the interdependency versus maintaining a strong individuality that can work well together. Yeah. That's a, that's huge, and that's how I think, you know, it's kind of funny. It's harder for a guy, by the way, to use the dating apps as a networking thing. Yeah. Like, uh, I have um, used them, like, intermittently over the years. Yeah. And have gone on there totally with the focus of, like, yeah, just be cool to meet some some people. And it's, like, uh, there's so much guarding of you know, getting to know somebody, it's like, this feels super cheesy and fake, and I'm not going to spend hours sending messages back and forth. Yeah. So it's like, you know, some of them have upgraded now where you can do like a video chat or talk, which I think is yeah. cool, but I don't have, if I don't have notifications on, it's like, whoops, like there's one person I was talking to, like we just, we spent basically like, it was like, yeah, let's, let's talk. This would be neat. And still haven't spoke because yeah. uh, she doesn't want to get up the phone number. She's like, not getting my yeah. phone number. Like, if I'm if I'm crazy, you can just block me. Like, it's really right. not that hard. I don't know. That's how I look at well, it. I'm I have like, been catfished. So ah, I understand the not giving out the phone number thing. Yeah. Well, I figured just a conversation, you know, because I don't want to, yeah. like, sit on this app and use the Agreed. filter of it. I'd rather just talk to somebody. Yeah. Um, but I can also imagine that, you know, th- those actions are probably based on experiences where yeah. people either catfish someone yeah. or... Uh, are not super honest about their motives. And so yeah, um, it's a strange world. And then there's the other thing where if you go out, you know, like my experience as a guy, it's like I don't want to be the guy that's out there just like flirting with people and like I'm going to yoga class like trying to hit on people. But it is more challenging to just like genuinely get to know somebody sometimes. It's like a 35-year-old single guy. Yeah. There's by default. Uh, many ladies will think I'm like trying to flirt with them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's so strange. Yeah. I mean, I would say nowadays because everybody's so closed off from the dating apps and Mm. like in their phones all the time and not aware of their surroundings. Mm -hmm. I think as if you feel the need to connect with somebody, (laughs) like just lightly do it, you know, have fun with it. And if it, it's not received well, there's not, there's no harm that can come of it. You know, the worst yeah. that happens is they say no. Well, and I, I kind of stay reserved on that side sometimes because of the, if you go to the same places over and over, True. right. Then it can be super weird. Right. And I but guess if you keep don't it really light, care. Yeah. You know, if, yeah. as long as you keep it super light, it doesn't have the opportunity to get weird. 
Well, okay. And then on the opposite side of that is that when I have kept it light, um, people are like hoping that I will flirt with them sometimes. I'm like, crap, mm-hmm. I was just trying to be nice and be friends. And now yeah. this person like thinks I'm flirting with them and they want to take it a different route. So it's like, it's messy. Yeah. <laughs> it's well, I'm a huge flirt regardless. <laughs> Girls, guys, whatever. That's just kind of my mode of operation. Just yeah. Kind of, you know, like having fun out there in the world. So yeah, it's good that you own it too. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, that can be problematic as well. So, you know, trying to tone that down in my older age has definitely been beneficial as well. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about your business. Mm-hmm. Where Where do you want to take this thing? Sure. So uh, my sister and I just recently partnered with some amazing guys, uh, Jay Campbell and Michael Jaco. Jay is actually local to where I am in Temecula, and Marietta, and... Uh, our mother sent us a video of them and I'm like, okay, yeah, what's the point? All right. I already know this stuff. And he said he was in Marietta. I was like, oh, great. So ended up designing their entire merchandise line and doing some really cool artwork for them. That's different than what we normally do. And I really, both of us really, really enjoyed that. Um, their whole theme is just kind of being really aware, being in a place of love, being aware of, you know, what your thoughts are and following your intuition. And while they have some, you know, political intel, a lot of it's about like your consciousness and, you know, raising your vibration and that sort of thing. So sounds pretty liberal. Yeah, I know you would think, right. <laughs> you would think when, uh, Michael's an ex Navy SEAL. So ah. yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Anybody uh, that wants to go check out somebody that is totally outside of the norm, definitely check these guys out. But hmm. yeah, we had so much fun designing for them. I actually brought back a drawing that I did when I was 16, just kind of of a hand, almost in this position, and doing stuff like grow your soul and things mm. like that. So we would love to partner with other brands and use our design skills to help further their businesses. That's always something that is really enjoyable for us to help other people um, you know, grow their business with an artistic vision and making that become a part of it because, you know, you can, you can get a lot out of marketing and branding and that sort of thing, but a logo is very different than a feeling that you get from looking at original art. So while we do the marketing and branding and websites and all that stuff, we love designing for other companies and would love to partner with more people in that regard. Okay, so so how would you describe like what's you know elevator pitch is a little bit outdated, but yeah. what, how would you describe your like what you do if if I were a potential client, mm-hmm. um, like yeah, what because so I because at first understood it as like graphics and logos that had your own thing, but now I hear mm-hmm. you partnering with businesses too. So these sure. are services that you offer to yes. everyone. Okay. Yeah. So we offer everything from designing a website to creating a logo uh, and a branding look, branding guidelines, colors, selecting all the things that, you know, people may have an idea of, but don't understand how the colors may work together or how that might actually become a logo that's near and dear to their mission statement. So we, as uh, an artistic team, obviously love working with other patriots if we can, uh, not a requirement, but (laughs) working with like-minded people is always great. And, you know, there's a lot of censorship in that community. So we like to support each other Mm. and, you know, having that kind of underlined alliance allows us to, you know, work with imagery that we're very familiar with and also turn it into something new. That's not just your traditional Americana stuff. We do mostly edgy original artwork. So we love doing that kind of stuff, but that's not to say we don't love a challenge. We, um, you know, we just love creating art for people that brings their vision to fruition. So I would say as a, a design our design services in a bundle, really. It's just bringing your visions to life as a business. That's cool. You just gave me a vision, and it is uh, Donald Trump <laughs> giving uh, Joe Biden uh, a ride on his shoulders. <laughs> so if we can make that happen. <laughs> we can make that happen. I oh, mean, all right. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And uh, how long have you been doing this? So we started the company in 2019. And we've been going strong since then. We've worked on quite a few other entrepreneurship ideas that didn't actually happen. So this was kind of the one that worked really well for us and our skill sets and working together as a team of sisters. And it's been a lot of fun. 
for both of us. Oh, that's freaking amazing. Yeah. yeah bringing business to family mm-hmm. is so cool because there's already that, you know, you've mentioned love a few times, mm-hmm. but you have that, that bond yeah. um, that can go crazy awry or be really powerful. But even when things, when there are challenges, because it's family, yeah, it can, you can make progress. Sure. Over it. I recently taken on some financial projects with family that if you asked me three or four years ago, I'd have been like, never. Yeah. Um, but there's been, and there's been so much emotional energy. There's a lot of energy tied to money. Yes. Too. Yeah. Um, but that's cool that you two are, are making that happen together. Do you have yeah. uh, a vision or a dream to like grow your team and bring more family in, not family? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we actually have, um, one wonderful little employee who I'm mentoring. We're both mentoring, and she's great. Uh, it's actually Jay, one of our partner's daughter, mm-hmm. and she is fabulous. And then we have uh, our dear friend's younger sister working for us as well. So it's been really cool to be working with younger females and kind of showing them the ropes and how they can start their own business and that sort of thing. Like That just makes my heart sing. Um, but one of the reasons why I really wanted to pursue entrepreneurship is because I wanted to create a working environment for people that I had never experienced before working for other people. And that's really important to me. I love creating environments. Uh, I work a couple of days at an interior design firm. I think it's important, not just spatially, but also mentally to give people the support and the appreciation that they deserve to really move forward and give them the confidence to grow. So I love the idea of having employees that we can really, you know, push forward into their own space and, you know, best version of themselves. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I actually spent a lot of time over the last six years working with a company called Best Version Media. Oh, really? (laughs) And that's a huge part of their culture is be the, you know, about being the best version of yourself. And when to do those hard things to grow, you you really have to um, show up that way. Are you going to go with an all-female team or are you going to invite some? No, I think... For me, it's whoever does the job best. I don't, you know, <laughs> I don't discriminate on Sounds very whatever it is. <laughs> mm. yeah. yeah, whoever is up to the task and can do the best job. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Well, congratulations. Thanks. Excited to check out some more yeah. of that. So let's see, we've got free, freedom of speech. You've mentioned censorship. Mm-hmm. That's a huge topic right yeah. now. It's been a huge tip topic for a long time. I saw what happened to... It's it's very interesting because on one side you have private companies mm-hmm. and the conservative mindset is let private companies do what they want. That's not that's kind of extreme, but give them more freedom over their business. Mm-hmm. Then you have a company like Apple mm-hmm. that banned the uh, the app Parler mm-hmm. um, because it had too much conservative speech. So it it seems kind of it's a very interesting area. Because there's because of the lack of regulation right. on those companies, um, it's it seems like a contradiction for a for a conservative to go, hey, we want free speech, and we want businesses to be able to make their own decisions. Then you have that, and you know, justifiably, are you allowed to be outraged at that? Right. Well, I think the distinction is uh, if you're talking about social media specifically. Yes, they are a private company, but if they're calling themselves a speech platform, Mm -hmm. that's the distinction. Mm. So if you are, you know, saying that you're a platform where people can speak their minds, then you can't, in my mind, you can't censor somebody because they have an idea you don't agree with. I... I have, I mean, we have so much experience with this. Instagram has shut down our account, I think, three times now on separate occasions. Um, The first time we were posting a little bit more controversial stuff. The second time was purely patriotic. So either they have our, you know, our IP address and they're like, no, we're just shutting them down again. Or, you know, it's because of our conservative values. And seeing that happen time and time again is something that makes me want to fight even harder because it's just purely unfair and it's, you know, akin to what we were talking about earlier. If you don't have other ideas around to balance out 
what the steady stream of is that you're getting on social media, wherever else, then you're purely having, you know, a one-sided outlook. And I just don't think that that's right. Whether it's, um, you know, somebody with liberal beliefs or not, I would fight for them to have the same free speech because that is what makes America what it is. You know, we are the land of the free and the home of the brave. And I don't want anyone to be stifled in their free speech, regardless of what their beliefs are. Yeah. Even if it's, um, you know, angry speech or speech that is, is hurtful, um, you know, I, I believe it should still be allowed because you have to be aware of those things. If you ignore that they exist, they're going to continue to be a problem or even grow. You mm -hmm. can't just ignore stuff. I had a Twitter account that I've had since like 2009, 2010 or something. I've had the Twitter account for a long time. Um, got deleted. I asked a question. I don't think it was aligned in any one particular political party. And it was a pretty point, pointed question. I was definitely asking some questions because I like to make people think, mm -hmm. you know, whether I have a friend that's conservative or liberal or, you know, Californian, which is like communist, I think. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I I just like to poke the bear. I like to challenge the thinking. Sure. And so, um, yeah, I got my account banned. It was kind of sad, but whatever. Rebuild it. Well, that's the problem is that I, at this point, I truly believe they do not want the narrative to be challenged. And that is what is so frustrating because that is what keeps us bright individuals. And, you know, I mean, I, I think the best solution for that is to just either not do it at all, like not be a part of those social platforms or find something that is. I mean, Gab is great. They were experiencing a lot of glitches when people went over from Parler. Uh, but Gab seems to be pretty solid now. I really like what the CEO, Andrew Torba, stands for. And they're all about free speech. And like you said, I don't think censoring people, whether it's hateful or not, is the way to go because you're just suppressing the problem at that point. And I, also, today's PC culture has just gotten to a whole new level of offended, I'm offended, that <laughs> it, you can't say anything now without somebody being offended. So mm. at what point do you say, you know what, I'm actually going to defend my right to say this, whether or not you're offended. I'm, like, I'm sorry that you're offended, but please... Let me have my right to say this. So, you know, I, I certainly hope that the pendulum's going to swing the other way at some point because it's really just at a point where it is just so ridiculous. You know, I, you know if people feel offended, that, that's on them. <laughs> that's within themselves. And they need to look at that and see why do you feel offended because there's always going to be differing opinions and ways of being. Mm. That's just the way the world is. And if all of that offends you, I would suggest, you know, taking a look at that. I have a rule about being offended that I share with uh, everyone close to me. And yeah. it is, I, I, you, it can't offend me. You can on a bad day, I guess. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, it wouldn't make sense if I can remind myself of this rule. And that is yeah. if somebody says something to me that is true, I can't be offended. Mm -hmm. it doesn't I have no right to be offended because it's true. Right. If somebody says something that's not true, mm -hmm. I can't be offended. It's not true. Who cares? No offense given where none is taken. Oh, there you go. So yeah. it's, yeah, so the being offended thing is weird. You know, the the fact that a company, like, I love my iPhone. I'm not going to give it up anytime soon. I don't have plans on it. But that they would take an app like Parler off of the App Store, you know, and then I hear, I have this first time I've heard of this thing called Gab, now, you could, I imagine, you know, create a website, run off of that, but it's not going to have the same access as it going into all the phones. Right. So there are ways around it, uh, but the main issue, I think, for a lot of other platforms that have tried to do the free speech social media thing is that, you know, the most common service that's out there, if you can't have your own server farm, is Amazon Web Services, and they're, the, they're in the same boat. I mean, they're all, you know, it's Amazon, Shopify, Etsy, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. They're all part of that censorship group. And, I mean, it's, it's a really sad thing to me uh, what, what that means because 
when you censor not just the anything that's angry or offensive, but when you censor an entire population mm -hmm. to that degree, like we're talking about communism here. This is the same thing as propaganda because if you're filtering out one perspective, then there's only one perspective left for people to soak up. And that is a very scary thing. You know, does that mean there's a space right now for a company to come in and build? I mean, essentially, you'd have to build a whole new, you need a new phone. You need, you need a whole new way of, of doing things. Yep. Um, and what's interesting, too, is it like Parler. I don't, I'm not an expert on it or Gab, mm -hmm. but my assumption, and could be a false assumption, is that nobody was stopping anybody with an opposing point of view from going on there. Yeah, I think Parler was basically a replacement for Twitter, where mm -hmm. all the conservatives went. Although I would say that there was a lot of banning going on there as well, and mm. the motives of that particular oh, company... See, that's upsetting. Yeah. Uh, the motives of that particular company are a little bit shaky as well. And the other thing is that if everybody's using Twitter and then all of a sudden all the conservatives go somewhere else, big tech is still accomplishing what they want to accomplish, which is getting rid of that other message because hmm. everybody just gets fed up and goes somewhere else. You know, the root of the problem is that people are still only seeing one side. So while Gab is a wonderful alternative for people to share like-minded ideas on the conservative side of things, it still is not helping the regular public who is already on Twitter see what some op opposing opinions might be. Like, for example, there was a Bill Gates commercial that had this woman, um, I can't remember her name at the moment, but she was doing like basically like Satanist worship artwork, like uh, performance art. There's like blood and human body parts, not real, but you know, who knows? Uh, and she was in Maria something. She was in this commercial and there were literally millions of people that were like, are you seriously having this woman in, in your commercial? Like she's a Satan worshiper, all this stuff where mm -hmm. the general public was actually able to see that. And I think mm. it got so many thumbs down or whatever that they actually took it down because the negative response was so strong. But when you have that entire population that was looking at that and saying like, what is going on here? move to another platform, the, re the average person who doesn't know who that is, is going to see that. And that's where I mm. think the, you know, the missing step is that's really important is that if everybody's on one platform, which who knows if that's ever going to happen with the state of division that we're in now, but I just think it's important to be part of something that is not one sided because, you know, I think if the average person went to gab, it might be a little gritty and <laughs> down and dirty for some people. So what I would love to see is something that's middle of the road that anybody could go on and not feel like they can't say what they want to say. There's one called Minds. Mm -hmm. It's been around for a while. Mm -hmm. I th and think that one is um, the atheist community. Is it really? I, I, I didn't know that. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's what I oh saw. Oh my yeah. gosh. Okay. It seems pretty cool. I get newsletters from them and I they I posted once when it first came out. I was like, oh, a new social media. This was years ago. Yeah. And so they've sent me like tokens and I, I don't know, whatever I posted was like liked or I don't know. So how the system is set up, but uh -huh. that's really interesting. The atheist community. It, it, you know, you've mentioned a couple of things where you talked about like, we talked about plant medicine and nature and kind of turn off devices. And there's just this recurring pattern in, in life. When I think of the yin and the yang symbol, mm -hmm. you know, there's the black on one side, white on the other, but each of them has a, a speck or a dot of the opposing yep. um, force in it. And it is just something that happens in life. You know, you, you can't have good without evil. You can't have, you know, bad without good, whatever versions of that are. So is this, I mean, is this just, is this the natural order of nature to have uh, this versus that? And, and is that part of the, you know, I, I think often of, you know, when I think of love and I think of Jesus and religion, I have so many conversations with friends, like Christian friends, Catholic friends, whatever. 
And as soon as anybody starts to go down or bad on another religion, I'm like, that to me seems like the opposing message of Jesus, which is to love everybody. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's very perplexing to see this constant conflict and kind of wonder if that's just the way we are supposed to be or the way we're designed to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do think that conflict is a huge part of human nature that, again, we can learn from constantly. Uh, But I do think that there's some sort of harmony that we can achieve as humans Mm -hmm. by, you know, being less offended and coming (laughs) together and, Mm -hmm. like, letting our ego down a little bit. So while, yes, I I do think that there's going to be conflict wherever you go, regardless of any situation, there there is always that push and pull between the two forces and that they do balance out, you know, there, there is a way to approach whatever scenario you're in, you know, as humans together and also as an individual that you can achieve a little bit more harmony. I think that's a beautiful piece there and uh, might be a good way to, to end this thing too, unless you have, I don't know, you have some like talking points or some things you're like, hey, I'd love to cover this or anything that, that comes to mind. No, I think we're we're pretty golden. This is great. Uh, the one thing I would say is just if anyone ever wants to reach out to us for design services, our website is just redpill45.com. Okay, what about um, give yourself some other plugs? I don't know, like social media or anything like that? Or? Yeah, um, we're on Instagram, but you never know, that could change. <laughs> so yeah. that is just redpill45.sisters, and everything will be updated on our website based on censorship. So I would just go and mm-hmm. find us there. Cool. So redpill45.com. Yep. That's awesome. I'll have to snag some of your artwork. I'm going to get you hooked up with those NFTs, too, so you can yeah. check that out. Sounds good. And uh, really glad that you came by to do this. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. <laughs> and ta-da. <laughs> Sweet. That was fun. I your pee so bad. Oh, my God. I thought about that. That was an hour and 41 minutes. Dang.